and this is Changing the Narrative. I'm your host, David Reeves, and we are changing the narrative every day and in every way. We have been spoon-fed a narrative of atheism, a narrative of naturalism, a narrative that says, hey, you're nothing more than star stuff. You're an accident of the cosmos. Uh, there's no need to worry about life because it's just life and death, and that's all there is. Well, that narrative has persisted for way too long, so we are changing the narrative back to truth. And on today's podcast, I have with me Tommy Lohman, who is the field paleontologist for the Glendive Fossil Museum in Montana and has dug up, literally dug up dinosaurs. I cannot wait to explore this topic. Welcome to the program, Tommy. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank it, you for having me. It's great to have you in studio here at the Wonder Center, and um, we've been trying to make this happen now for a, a little while. We have. Uh, so I'm glad that you are here. You're actually... Uh, and I have to be careful about the way I say this because this episode will not air until after this happens. But tonight, my time, tonight, mm -hmm. you're going to be on stage in the Wonders uh, Center actually sharing a live broadcast about behemoth. Is that yeah, correct? That is correct. I'm looking forward to getting to share. I can't wait. I can't wait. Tell me just a little bit about your history number one, and then how you got interested in dinosaurs to start with. <laughs> uh, well, the second one is I think I was born with that interest, <laughs> as a lot of little boys and girls are. Yeah. Uh, I remember waking up Christmas morning when I was five, six, seven years old and having the latest dinosaur toy or book, and there was a fascination yeah. with them. But that grew and really almost went away mm -hmm. because I really battled with that Genesis narrative of understanding is that really real and where do you put dinosaurs into the bible yeah and that was such a, a confusing point for me and oddly enough it wasn't until jurassic park came out in 1993 i i joke about that being an evangelistic movie which it is obviously far <laughs> from that but what it triggered in me is is to re-engage with some questions i'd had most of my life yeah. kind of figuring that out that worldview, and then um in 2011, my wife and I went up to Glendive, Montana, to the to a, do a week long dinosaur dig. Okay, uh, just to fulfill a childhood dream. And uh, by the end of that week, I felt the Lord impress upon me to be more involved, to continue to be involved with this ministry and the work that was going on up there. Yeah. And so I told my wife, she was a little stressed for a moment, <laughs> but we sat down. Uh, the night before we left with uh, Otis and Miriam Klein yeah. and uh, just told him, I said, look, we don't know what the Lord's leading us to do exactly, but we want to come back. And that has has proven to be a, a blessing. The Lord has illuminated our hearts and our minds, has helped us to grow. And so I now serve, as you mentioned in the intro, as field paleontologist for the museum. And uh, what a blessing, not just to get to excavate dinosaur fossils, but to get to share the truth of the gospel, yeah, to get to anchor people's hearts and minds in the reality of the history of Scripture, beginning with, in the beginning, God created. Okay, so you just mentioned something that doesn't seem like a likely pair. And of course, I know it is, and that's what I really appreciate about science and Scripture, right? But you're, you're like... Well, this opens up opportunities to share the gospel message. Oh, yeah. How how does dinosaurs and the gospel fit together? What is what is it about this stumbling block mm -hmm. about the way we have learned about dinosaurs in children's books and in those movies like Jurassic Park over the years that has become so twisted and so agenda driven that it literally keeps people away from the gospel mm -hmm. itself? I think at the core of it, it is the fact that the flood mm -hmm. of Noah's day in Genesis 6 and 7 is not a random or rogue geological event, but is the direct judgment of God upon the sin of humanity. And with that, there are implications within the ground, including the fossils, that are not just uh, mere events that we just look at. There's no, it's not a slow, gradual process. I spend all of my summers evaluating and looking at the, the scope and the scale of the ground, uh, how much sediment's been put down by water mm -hmm. and how much water has eroded sediment away. And so the testimony of the ground uh -huh. is of a global flood. And in that, the implications 
behind that are really quite profound. Uh, you have to be reminded that that is the case. The Bible is true yeah. and that God does, in fact, judge sin. Now, with the perspective of the gospel, and this is the beautiful thing about it, is who is Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. It is the fact that I need a Savior. Right. I need someone to rescue me both physically but more spiritually from this world that God is going to, in, in the end, judge. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3, mm -hmm. Peter talks about uh, that the scoffers deny the evidence of creation. Mm -hmm. They deny the evidence and the scriptural evidence of the flood. Yeah. But he takes it beyond that and he says the implications are one day Christ will return and the, the world will be basically destroyed. Yeah. And that final judgment's coming. He's relating the coming destruction. Yes. And the coming judgment to the judgment of Noah's day mm -hmm. to a literal historical event that actually took place right in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. He's talking about it and he's saying that, yeah, in those latter days, people are going to say, yeah, uniformitarianism, everything's mm -hmm. continued as it was, slow, gradual processes, dinosaurs died out, you know, 66 plus million years ago. Uh, strata has been deposited over millions and even billions mm -hmm. of years mm -hmm. and so therefore we don't need to trust anything in the biblical record including what it tells us about our savior's return mm -hmm. but what you see in that and you're right on because we even see jesus doing that yeah. in uh, i think it's matthew 24 talking about his return and tying it back to the to the flood of Noah's day and those are profound implications yeah. and so there's a the ground the rock record the testimony we see in the earth reminds us of the authenticity of scripture in fact we see this correlation what both Peter and Jesus are doing is they're tying this spiritual implications to a literal event they're making it historical mm -hmm. so it's not just that jesus is historical but he's tying his future return to a past literal historic event right and that's that's important we can't overlook that wow wow that's powerful and mm -hmm. of course that's what you've been fighting for to to represent right tell me a little bit more about Glendive Fossil Museum, the ministry that you're a part of, the the progression of how you got to where you are today. Hmm. Well, you know, in entering into the museum and returning to continue the work up there, we spend all of our summers up there now. Okay. And uh, and in that, we learned the process of excavation and fossil prep, and that's been wonderful. But what we've begin to grow in is to understand where are our gaps in knowledge both from a paleontology standpoint but also a theological framework making sure we understand these arguments well and so we got into just really learning and investing it i have a job that pays the bills <laughs> but i enjoy the the work that this does so this becomes a passion and a hunger that I spend regular time investing into the word, uh, reading scientific research papers. And so I press myself into that. And so we spend every summer having guests come up to the museum, uh, week long groups, uh, other ministries, individuals, grandparents with grandchildren, mm -hmm. parents, homeschool parents, youth groups yeah. and we get to in that not just teaching the process of paleontology but to kind of root this message in fact uh my wife and i were talking about this coming up this past summer up to uh, montana is we felt the lord was pressing upon our hearts to make sure we're being very clear in the spiritual implications about what people are seeing because yeah. the tendency is i want to come up and collect a few fossils i want right. to find a t-rex tooth uh, you know whatever the thing is we certainly enjoy that but i wanted to be sure that people see something more than that yes. in their experience yeah that's important um everybody like you said, a lot of people from an early age mm -hmm. including myself are always fascinated with dinosaurs yeah. and like oh one day i'm going to dig up a dinosaur i'm going to dig up a dinosaur that doesn't always stop 
as you grow up, right? No, no it doesn't. I mean, I have had literally mid 80s people come on paleontological digs with me mm -hmm. who were like, we have always dreamed about it and we've still never been able to make it happen. And what you just brought up is important because I'm always like, yeah, well, you're going to find some incredible things. But more than what you find is what you're going to realize is how mm -hmm. the Bible is going to come alive based on what you've seen. You're going to see these catastrophic processes that have buried these bones so quickly that there's no way that the secular narrative could be correct. Mm -hmm. So when you finally realize that it's time to change the narrative that we've been spoon fed in paleontology, uh, it's an eye opening moment and people come back radically. Tra I'm sure you have stories like oh, yeah. that as well. Yeah, but people sure. come back radically transformed. Mm -hmm. um, two days ago, you got back uh, from a um, an entire season up in Montana. Mm -hmm. Two days ago, I got back from leading a photo safari to South Africa. Um, what did you find during this season of time? Can you just highlight a couple of little pieces that maybe you and the teams have discovered over the past several months? Well, largely we're digging in an area where there's um, what I call a secondary deposit. So we've got individual pieces that have been mixed up. So okay. we're finding uh, Tyrannosaurus rex tibia, which was cool. Wow. Uh, and then Montosaurus, which is a duckbill dinosaur vertebra and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, we found a really nice Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. Actually, we found a couple of them. Really? And, and even in mixed in that, we found, um, I think it was a metatarsal. Okay. And a Montosaur foot bone. Yeah. And what we're seeing is evidence of predation and or scavenging wow so we're seeing marks on the bone bite marks bite marks ha. which is another dynamic to kind of really begin to comprehend what all was going on yeah. uh, during the flood and so those are kind of some of the key interesting things uh, that we've been working on last summer we got to excavate a duckbill dinosaur in and in montasaurus yeah uh 65 of the skeleton okay let's talk a little bit about ed for a mm -hmm. second a lot of times you know, children love learning the names. But what I find that a lot of books don't mention is how practical the names are. For example, the Edmontosaurus. Mm -hmm. Why is it named the Edmontosaurus? <laughs> well, it's basically a lizard from Edmo Edmonton. <laughs> so yeah, uh, they got really fancy with that one. Specimens mm -hmm. were found in Edmonton, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it, it was named. Uh, same with, you know, Tyrannosaurus rex, Tyrant King Lizard. Mm -hmm. Same with Acrocanthosaurus. Just break it down. Acro, high canthos, mm -hmm. spine, saurus, lizard. It's yeah. a high spine lizard, right? Uh, on and on and on and on. But it seems very exotic, doesn't it? It can. Um, I find it interesting, is, is since you've mentioned this, how many names, there's this always this push for new species. Oh, and so everything is new, it uh -huh. seems. And I'm, I'm obviously uh, generalizing. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's so much of that's trying to fit an evolutionary narrative mm -hmm. or just simply trying to get your name right in, in the paper, if you will. Yeah. And so, you know, that press to get new names and when really what you're seeing are just slight genetic variations within a created kind. Uh, you may be seeing slight variations uh, due to just male and female mm -hmm. distinction. Uh, there's another term called ontogeny, hmm. where you just see changes over the arc of a, the life of an animal. A triceratops uh, frill, brow horns may alter them sh their shape to some degree. The, the pachycephalosaurus may mm -hmm. change some over the years. So it's really this naming system has usefulness to a degree, but it also they're always pressing things into an evolutionary narrative. So in other words, if you look through paleontological research you're going to find all these ceratopsids and they're going to be you know oh it's a different species this is a different species mm -hmm. this is a... and what you're saying is some of it may be in an attempt to uh to push an evolutionary agenda that there's been all of this um evolutionary mutational change and we mm -hmm. don't we don't disagree there there's been mutational changes yeah. uh but at the same time, it's not about the passage of time and the vast number of creatures that have existed. Sometimes you're just looking at stages of development and growth. Sometimes you're looking at uh, tiny adaptations, mm -hmm. when in reality, they're fairly similar creatures across the family level. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned it a moment ago, a lot of it does have to do with the discoverers. 
Uh, oh, yeah. The paleontologist who discovered these bones, every single one of them has this longing to become famous, to be written into the history books. To put your name on a dinosaur. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, uh, oh, well, it, it's not exactly like any other bone we've ever found so so far it's 98 percent, but it's not exactly like it so mm -hmm. let's classify it as a different species so we can uh, get our name in the history books mm -hmm. and uh, certainly there's that allure mm -hmm. you you understand that yeah. but you're trying to build something into an argument uh, that's really not knowable I mean, you think about, as you were talking about the genetic variation within a created kind mm -hmm. so you get all the ceratopsids so you can you can see the, the changes, but so often that gets plugged into this timeline mm -hmm. and all we have are the skeletons. All we have are the bones. Yeah. Talk about that for a second. Yeah. Because we see these fleshed out models in the movies, in the books, mm -hmm. in, you know, children's kindergarten resources uh, and stickers that we've played with as a, as a child, right? We see these fleshed out models. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for a second. Well, there's, you know, I think you can do a lot with a skeleton because it's amazing what you can determine from a mm -hmm. skeleton. Mm -hmm. So let me start with that. Uh, there's blood grooves. There's, we find skin impressions. Mm -hmm. We can see where muscles would have attached. Mm -hmm. There's even been some sense about maybe some assumptions about color. Mm -hmm. So you can get some general ideas about that. but. But you see, in particular, with the feathers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the the bias, the assumptions of evolutionary progression, mm -hmm. uh, you see them. Everything's got feathers on it now. It seems, and right. I'm obviously being uh, general as well. But you see this this press to get feathers because what's the narrative? Mm -hmm. The narrative is that dinosaurs evolved into birds, and there's avian dinosaurs and there's non-avian dinosaurs, right. and that narrative flows. And really, there's no basis for that. In fact, the fossil evidence doesn't really even press us to feathers. Mm -mm. In fact, there's some really great insights going on right now with respect to to uh, possible collagen, uh, you know, quills. And look, if God put feathers on dinosaurs, that's great. Sure, that's fine. Yeah. It still doesn't prove they evolved in any sense. So, right. um, no, the fact that the fact that you know there's hair on lots of different creatures mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're related. It means that they had a similar engineer or similar designer. The it, fact that you know there are four limbs and hind limbs on many different yeah. creatures doesn't mean that they're all related to one another. It means that they uh, that it's a structurally efficient design, right? Mm -hmm. So engineering wise, it makes sense. So there is this push and there is this narrative and it is all atheistic in origin because if the Bible is true and God created all of the different animal kinds, the basic family groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we don't need to try to explain the origin of dinosaurs or where they went or the origin of birds and where mm -hmm. they came from, right? But if Darwinian, if universal common descent is true, if everything in the universe commonly descended from a tiny single-celled organism that sprung to life mm -hmm. and then created fish, bird, ape, man, etc., then you do have to explain where did dinosaurs come from, where did birds come from, how is everything related together? And that's the push that we've seen mm -hmm. to try to explain, well, dinosaurs, they never really completely went extinct they just got smaller sprouted complete wings and flew off as big chickens right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and, and it's, it's funny when you say it that yeah way. yeah but that's what's being pushed as mm -hmm. the narrative mm -hmm. but you see the the attack against scripture mm -hmm. you see the attack against a historical narrative you see the attack against god as creator because what this darwinian evolution does uh although poorly is try to create a narrative of how life has diversified mm -hmm. over vast amounts of time uh, to come to its current state, even though there's no scientific evidence to support Darwinian evolution. But what that does, it refutes the need for God as creator. Mm -hmm. And what we see in Genesis chapter one is this beautiful narrative. While, it, while we may still walk away with, I wish I knew a little bit more, it is sufficient for us to see God created flyers, yeah. swimmers, land animals. Yeah. He created them after their kind. Mm -hmm. 
Right. We even see in chapter two, Adam naming the animals. That's not just a throwaway concept. Right. Adam is doing something very tangible and very specific, something very scientific. Yeah. He really True. is. Yes. In naming Observing the Observing different types yes. of animals and giving them names. And so as you mentioned just a minute ago, he's seeing the basic body plan. Mm-hmm. And, but he's recognizing distinctions. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's and we, he's not killing the animals and just getting the bones. He's seeing them alive and moving, yeah. which is why our limit where we're going to have real limitations with doing that with dinosaurs. But he, he's doing something really beautiful. Where is he getting these names from? Mm-hmm. Where is he getting this concept from? Mm-hmm. Because it was infused into him from God at creation. Because he's made in his image. Exactly. Wow. Wow. That's re- when you think about it that way. And we all are, which is the yeah. reason that we can recognize God's design, mm. which is the reason that we can appreciate mathematics and science. And we have the mental acuity to philosophize about our existence, which is something that you don't find within the ape world, do no. you? No. Um, It's all pointing back to one thing being consistent, and that's God's Word. But even within that, we're finding things, you mentioned, well, we find the the skeletons of these. And Mm -hmm. then you can take some artistic license in order to try to determine how they look. Yet, some cultures, many cultures, have some type of a representation of a dragon or dinosaur-like creature. Mm Mm-hmm. And most of the time, it's represented flesh on. Mm -hmm. What would that indicate? Well, it would indicate they saw this animal alive. Okay. Uh, That's clearly what's going on here. And it's... It's something that you see all over the world. Mm-hmm. You can go into the here in the United States. You can go into South America. You can go into Europe. Uh, you can go into the far uh, far east. You you see these representations. These people were engaging with these animals. Yeah. To one degree or another. Which again doesn't fit the narrative that we've been fed, but it does fit a biblical narrative that dinosaurs have been alive within the past few thousand years Mm -hmm. and recently met their extinction. Most of them went extinct during the great flood of Noah's day, a literal great deluge that would have covered them over so quickly that it would have preserved them. Now, talk a little bit about the articulation of some dinosaur bones and sort of the implications of the, the way we find dinosaurs in the state of preservation. Well, the state of preservation can often be quite decayed and, and broken apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we try to do is try to build them back together in a correct anatomical framework. Okay. And that's just simply done by just understanding how life works today. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're trying to figure out how bones connect. And so in that, we can get a sense of what these animals may have looked like, how they may have moved. Uh, and uh, that you get into the terms like biomechanics, yeah, which I'm intrigued by, is to see how these animals function in that way. So it's uh, it's interesting to try to unpack and uh, and recreate these animals in a manner that makes sense. Yeah, and, and oftentimes the the artwork is useful, but we also, as you were talking about the the ability to recognize the hand of God in creation. There's an intuition that recognizes function and form and structure. And if we can take these bones, I can can pull a skeleton out of the ground, if you will, and I can see how those bones would have related together and what potential capacities, uh, like bone proportion. Yeah. Uh, If a leg bone is long and slender versus thick and heavy, that's gonna give me an indication how it moved as to whether this was a runner right or it was more built for power wow interesting interesting so it's piecing back together the past in the most likely manner yeah and there's some really good work done in for pay from paleontologists there okay to try to understand that relationship of how these bones do work and because we really want to know what did these animals look like sure we're amazed by them. We're in awe by them. And as we started this conversation, as, as little boys and little girls, mm-hmm. where are they? And what was amazing about them? Yeah. Their size, their uniqueness. 
how can we be inspired? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Tell me just a little bit more about the ministry. You work with other ministries and other groups to coordinate dinosaur digs in Montana. Is mm-hmm. that correct? That is correct. We really have an opportunity with an access to fossils yeah. that is kind of unique. And so we recognize the importance of being able to share these opp- opportunities with other people, with other ministries, mm-hmm. where they'll bring their uh, their base, if you will, and bring some of their guests and come up. And uh, so we open that door for that opportunity. Uh, we recognize how the Lord has blessed us in this way. And yeah. so we're, it's it's a joy to be able to share these experiences with other people. Absolutely. Uh, what is, uh, what's the website? How can we get in touch with? It's creationtruth.org. Creation. That's the best way to go through. You can contact me through that. Okay. It, uh, we produce a new dig schedule okay. um, first to next year. So there's a little tab for digs as well. Yeah. That's the best way to access, but it's creationtruth.org. Creationtruth.org. Any social media? Uh, are you on Facebook or anything? Or mostly the website is the best I am. Face, Facebook works, Thomas okay. Lohman. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Tommy, so much for being here and, and for sharing this with us. What you're doing is changing the narrative. You're changing the narrative that we have been fed when it comes to these dinosaurs, when it comes to the past, uh, a meteorite impact mm-hmm. supposedly killing everything 66 plus million years ago. And, uh, and yet we see these dinosaurs as actual proof, as validity of the biblical record mm-hmm. in every way. It's so encouraging. It is so inspiring. And, uh, and I can't wait to have you back on some future programs. My ple- it would be my pleasure. Well, I want to thank you for joining us on Changing the Narrative. Uh, until our next time, I want you all to keep looking up. I'm David Reeves. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Hmm. Find us on all social platforms to stay informed. Watch Genesis Science Network 24-7 for free on Roku, Fire TV, and on our website. Visit the world's largest origins-based store, creationsuperstore.com. Plan your trip to the Wonders Center and Science Museum just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Donate to our nonprofit ministry to help us continue sharing truth.